you've been replaced. Well, evangelicals say that. Yeah, well. Many. You've been replaced. We're the real Israel now. Okay, so now go share the love of Jesus to somebody you've just offended. Wow. And Paul knew that that was going to happen. And he said, have a love and a heart for the Jewish people. You know why? Because everything you believe is Jewish. Right. Right? Everything right. we're going to do today is Jewish. Now, you're Jewish, more Jewish than most. Okay? Because we're meeting on Shabbat. <coughs> we're going to read the parasha. Most churches don't even know what the parasha is. Okay? We're going to do Hebrew prayers. So, it's a privilege to be here this morning. So, I want to give you uh, uh, a glimpse now into my words. Because not only have Christians not done a very good job of witnessing to Jewish people. Some have done a very good job. I got saved mm -hmm. through the witness of a Korean girl. The, the question is a lot of Christians don't understand what Jewish people believe and not believe about a lot of different things, especially about the Messiah. So growing up, I was very typical of what Jewish people believe about the Messiah. It's not Jesus. That's all I heard. But you're still waiting for them. They're still waiting for them. Right, but we don't study Messianic prophecy. Right. All I was told was this. We're waiting for the Messiah. We know it's not Jesus because when the Messiah comes, he'll bring... Come on. He'll bring peace. Yeah. Is it very peaceful outside? No. no. Is it peaceful for the Jewish people? No. No. So how could Jesus possibly be the Messiah? He didn't even do the most basic thing that the Jewish people are waiting for. So here's what I'd like to do this morning in about um, half an hour. Let me give you a glimpse of what Jewish people understand about the Messiah. Let me give you a glimpse of what the Jewish people were expecting about the Messiah when Jesus came. And then we're going to discuss a little interesting subject called Messiah ben Joseph. You're in the book of Genesis dealing with Joseph, right? Mm -hmm. Well, he shows up in rabbinic Judaism a lot, especially when it comes to the Messiah. And I want to explain some of that to you. So if you're talking to somebody who's Jewish, you can maybe hopefully get them to see what you believe is not Catholic or Christian. It's very Jewish. Amen? Amen. Well, let me pray for our time together and then we'll begin. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father and King. I want to thank you for, for the scriptures. I want to thank you for sustaining these scriptures, Lord, because it's the truth. It's where we go to know what the truth is, not to somebody else who's never read this. So, Lord, open up the scriptures today, and I ask your blessing in the name of Yeshua. Amen. So the question is, at the time of Jesus, what kind of Messiah was Jewish people waiting? Now, there's a few different passages that we can put together, but let me make it easy for you. If you want to just talk to a Jewish person and say, here's kind of what the Jewish people were expecting back then, at the time of Yeshua, and even today, there's a chapter that will make it very easy for you. Okay? So I want you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. Okay? Ezekiel chapter 37. And I'm going to I'm going to read some passages and you're going to tell me we're going to look at five main things that the Jewish people for the most part were waiting for back then when Jesus was around and the five main things that they still expect would happen today. Okay? So we're in Ezekiel chapter 37. Okay, and we're going to begin reading uh, on verse 21. Uh, verse 21. <coughs> Say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations where they have gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. So what's checkbox number one that has to happen? They're back in the land. 
Now you have to understand that 500 years before Jesus, who took the Jewish people out of the land? The Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar. So over those few hundred years, it doesn't say instantly everybody comes back. You can see that the Jewish people over the years had seen a great migration of Jewish people back to the land. So if you were Jew at the time of Jesus, you could check off box number one. Amen? Amen. Okay, so that's the first one. It will be um, back to the land. Okay? Um, what verse are you going to uh, That was verse uh, 21. Okay? All righty. Verse 24. My servant David will be king over them. When the Messiah comes, the Jewish people expect that he would reestablish the monarchy. Was the monarchy around at the time of Yeshua? No. You had King Herod. But guess what? When it says, my servant David, you know what the first thing you have to do to be the king of Israel? You've got to be from the right tribe. There's even debate whether Herod was even Jewish because where he's from, Adamia, they believe that maybe his great-grandfather or grandfather had actually converted to Judaism. So he's definitely not from the tribe of David, and there's a lot of speculation that he's not even Jewish. So you have to establish the monarchy, but more importantly, you have to be from the tribe of David. Okay? Could, could at that time, could somebody prove, and we'll just use Yeshua, could he prove that he was from the tribe of David? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. It's the first verse of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Right? This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of Abraham, the son of David. Why? Because before you do anything in Judaism, you want to declare yourself to be the Messiah. You better prove you're Jewish and you're from the tribe of David. Now, the Jews don't accept the New Testament. Is that correct? So that it doesn't one... matter. That's his genealogy. Okay. Nobody's ever debated his genealogy. Okay. You know why? Because they kept him in the temple. Okay? So, at the time of Jesus, could somebody check off box number two? Could you prove you're from the house of David? Yes. Yes. Very good. Okay? And they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes. So you need the monarchy so that you can have a complete idea of how Judaism works. It doesn't work all by itself. It works with the king. It works with the priesthood who are now ministering in the temple. Okay? So, um, it's not fulfilled when other people were overseeing stuff. Because the Jewish people couldn't keep all of the commandments at the time of the Romans. Did you know that? They couldn't. Because the Sanhedrin wasn't allowed to do certain things. Hence, when the king comes, kick everybody out. And then you have this theocracy that works. So, at the time of Yeshua, they were coming back to obeying all the laws. And you see that kind of in the Jewish mindset, because they kind of see the Pharisees as kind of bringing back that. Now, there's going to be a debate between the Pharisees and Jesus on how to interpret the law. But they could see that, hey, when the king comes, we're waiting for it, but we can see steps that we're getting more and more religious. Okay, so box number three could potentially be there at the time of Jesus as well. Okay, box number four. Okay, um, verse 27. My dwelling place will also be with them. What did the average Jewish person see at the time of Jesus? The rebuilding of the temple. It started basically in what we would call Second Temple Judaism, which is when the Jewish people were allowed to rebuild the temple after the 70 years in captivity, about 535 B.C. But more specifically, if you're living at the time of Jesus, Herod has just rebuilt the temple. Okay? 
okay? So I want you to kind of picture yourself at the time of Jesus as a Jew. The Jewish people are now coming back to the land. Boom. We still have the genealogy, so somebody could prove he's from the tribe of David. Boom. The Jewish people are becoming more religious. Boom. The temple's rebuilt. Can you see a lot of messianic expectations at that time? Sure. Yeah. That's why Nicodemus asked Jesus, are you him? Okay? Nicodemus was not a secret believer. You know why? He didn't know what to believe. And we're going to get to that next. But at that point, Nicodemus was thinking that Jesus, he's got a quite a following. They know he's from the tribe of David. He might be possibly the one. He was a sincere seeker. And finally, here's what happens when the ultimate Messiah comes. If we go back one verse to verse 26, I will make a covenant of peace. The Messiah will bring peace to Israel among their enemies. Okay? Now, they know that that hasn't happened yet, but it was time because they had a timetable. Anybody know the timetable for the kingdom? Remember Jesus kept on preaching? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what kingdoms were they looking at and what timeline were they looking at? We won't go back there, but they had a timeline based on Daniel. Daniel chapter 2 said there'll be four kingdoms, correct? So what are those kingdoms in order that Daniel predicted exactly? First one. Second. Right? Third. Fourth. And then the the stone that nobody can crush will crush all the others. So you're looking around and you're going, well, Rome's in place. <laughs> the timeline is ready. Forget going into Daniel chapter 9. We won't do that this morning. Because that's very, very precise. But we're just going to make what the average Jewish person saw. Rome's in place. The next kingdom that Daniel says is the Messianic kingdom. So everything is set. And then you know what happens? Jesus dies. So what do you think? Look at the two guys of Emmaus. Right? Right? Hey, isn't that cool? Jesus kind of pops up behind him and goes, hey, what's up? Well, haven't you heard? And what does Jesus say? Heard what? (laughs) It's cool, right? Because he knows what happens. (laughs) He wanted to hear it from them. And he goes, didn't you hear? It's been three days and he hasn't risen. And we thought he was the one. But he died. Because if you're going to be a king to defeat your enemies and you die, you lose. Right? Yeah. And then Jesus says, beginning with Moshe, Moses, right? The T and the Tanakh, the right. Torah, and all the prophets, he showed them what? The stuff came to the side. Right. They had no idea. Did you know that? about this suffering Messiah. No idea. Because until Jesus came, they needed the picture. So you know what the New Testament does? It builds a puzzle from pieces of the Old Testament of all the things that the Messiah was going to do the first time. Now, they didn't understand that there would be two comings. They didn't understand that the Messiah was coming to bring another type of peace beforehand until Jesus came. And today, we would call that picture, in, in English, the suffering servant. Mm-hmm. But in Judaism, do you know what we call that picture? There's two messiahs mm-hmm. in the scriptures. We looked at Messiah ben David. Right. What Jesus is going to show them is Messiah ben Joseph. Because Joseph suffered. And then he went away, and then he came back. So there's this idea that there's two messiahs in the Jewish world. Mm. Now, until Jesus comes, the Jewish people have no idea. No idea, okay? And so what I want to show you is 
kind of how Jesus introduced it, and then later on how the rabbis took that and now made it more Jewish, because they have to respond. Right. Okay? So, we're going to throw in a couple of other things, too, because to explain Messiah ben Joseph, right, there's a couple of other things that the Jewish people weren't expecting with the Messiah. And this is really what he explained to, to, to Nicodemus. If you went back into the Old Testament, right, Remember um, they were debating who gets into heaven? And Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now how do you think Nicodemus was teaching and telling everybody else how to get into heaven? Be a good Jew. Now he's a rabbi. You think Nicodemus even debated whether he was going into heaven or not? No. Would a rabbi today think he wouldn't be going to heaven? He's doing one of the most beautiful things in Judaism. Mm -hmm. But if the rabbi of Beth Israel, is that the name of the congregation of Meridian, came in through that door right now, what would we tell him? He goes, I'm a good Jew, I'm in. <laughs> you must be born again. born again. And he would go, what? Because... If you told somebody today you were born again, what are you telling that person? Mm. You hear the word born again. In our vernacular today, the world wants you to think there's two types of Christians, right? right? The more liberal Christians that just go to church and then just pretty much do everything else on their other six days. They're the good Christians because they don't cause any problems. Then you get these born again. Man, they believe the Bible is actually true. Come on, they Lord. believe there's only one way to heaven. Yeah, they're a big problem. Yeah. Right? Because we're not going along with the agenda, are we? No. So when you say today you're born again, you're yeah, you're a Trump loving, black Bible carrying, gun loving, Mississippian <laughs> Christian, right? right? Yeah. yeah. What did Nicodemus understand about that term? Which is actually a very Jewish term. Did you know that? That's what we call it. Yeah. And you know why anybody know what he, Nicodemus would have thought of that? I was told when you're mixed with it, they claim you're born again. Is that correct? It's a term that, for the most part, was used for Gentiles. Right. And they, they converted to Judaism. Yeah. You go into the mikvah. Okay. You know what the mikvah is? Yeah. It's a womb. It's a lot of, and you would go in and you would dunk yourself three times in the name of the rabbi that you were studying with. And then when you come up, they say, boom, you're born again because you're no longer Gentile. Right. You're Jewish. And in Judaism, you're not allowed to tell somebody, oh, you're a convert. No. You might have converted, but once you come up, you're born again. You're a Jew. So in a sense, Jesus was telling Nicodemus, you must be like a Gentile convert to get to heaven. Mm. And just like a rabbi today, if you said, you mean I have to be like those guys in Mississippi who read their Bible every day to be born again? The same idea. Both of them would sit there and go, are you crazy? <laughs> but that's what Jesus was trying to get to Nicodemus. You can't be born in the flesh and assume just because you're a Jew you're going to heaven it's got to be like a Gentile convert and I love what Jesus tells Nicodemus at the end because Nicodemus goes how can this be and he goes you're the teacher of Israel because Nicodemus didn't know and then Jesus explains who he was going to be but he does it using code mm -hmm. he does it using the Old Testament and if you went to John chapter 3 he uses three scriptures to tell him who he was. First, he said, who has ever gone up into heaven right. but the Son of Man who came from heaven? So you know the first thing that Jesus did when he was sharing who this whole Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David works? The first thing that you weren't expecting is 
that the Messiah, even though he's going to be from the tribe of David, right? He's fully human, but fully God. Were they expecting the Messiah to be fully God? No. Not at all. But he goes to Daniel and he talks about one like a human, Ben Adam, is up in the heavens and he's presented to the days of our and, and to him is given a kingdom and glory that all nations would serve him. So the first thing you need to Nicodemus to understand, hey, before you move on, not only am I sharing with you how to get to heaven, but I'm going to share with you who the real Messiah is. One, he's God in the flesh. Right. Mm -hmm. Two, Nicodemus goes, oh, like the serpent lifted up in the wilderness. Where'd he go there for? That's a weird passage. It's a few verses. Ah, Jewish people sin. They're dying. They can't help themselves. Moses, go help us. Go to God. Moses comes back, gathers the team, says, okay, here's the deal. Say seven Hail Marys, right? <laughs> Do a bunch of mitzvot and you're it. No. He says, he, God told me to tell you guys to do something that hmm, kind of weird. The thing that's killing you, this 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 servant, warns him, stick him on a stick, and all you have to do is focus on him. Believe that he can save you and you're saved. And they went, what? <laughs> that's kind of weird, Moses. He goes, came from God. So they did it, and guess what happened? He believed. You know why that story is there? One reason. Because God knew later on you would need that story. Yeah. Right? Yeah. To understand the same thing. You know when I think Nicodemus got saved? When he saw Jesus on the cross. He sure. went, man, how did he know? How did he know he was going to die like that? Right? Right. Right? Yeah. Psalms of David. Yeah. And he's making it very Jewish. But nobody knows that story is messianic until Jesus comes. Right? Because right? then he comes. And then you see him up on the stick. And if you're Jewish, what does the serpent represent? Something good or something really bad? Bad. bad. If you talk to a Jewish person today, is it easy to get a Jewish person to see the cross as something really good? No. It's been used as something really bad, right? Mm -hmm. And I think God knew that as well. It was going to be a stumbling block for the Jews. That the cross to us is the most glorious image in the world that saves. Mm -hmm. But to a Jewish person, it's been used to beat them and kill them and mm -hmm. all sorts of abuse. But yet, you still got to point the Jewish person to that. Mm -hmm. But it's very Jewish. You think it was easy for Moses to tell Jewish people, I can't save you, but that serpent will save you. Isn't that interesting? Why does he tell Nicodemus that? Because Nicodemus doesn't know that. The second thing that the Jewish people weren't expecting was that the Messiah would die. And the third thing, which is true even today, when Jewish people look in a church, who do they predominantly see? Yeah, and they go, yeah, not Jewish. They don't do anything Jewish. Cross, yeah, that's not Jewish. Little piece of bread and Little cup of wine, that's not Jewish, because Jews, we drink big cups of wine. Right. <laughs> we do it good. Yeah, we don't want to forget this little thing. What's that? That's not Jewish. What do you have for church? Right? When does they have a church meet? Right. Not Jewish. Right? So they look at the church and go, how could Jesus possibly be the Jewish Messiah? Because everybody who's in the church is not Jewish. Right. So, you know what Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus? That's the plan of God. The plan of God isn't that the Jewish Messiah is just coming for Jews. He's coming for everybody. And that was another thing that the Messiah Ben Joseph was going to bring in. See, because if you're just the king of David, you're for the Jews. Right. If you're Joseph, where did Joseph serve? In Israel? Egypt. Egypt, right? Mm -hmm.
See that whole story coming together? So this is what Jesus was attempting to do. That the New Testament um, does so well. Now, the rabbis, after Jesus dies, and the story doesn't start, does it? No. Now what do they do with this? Because now they have to confront it. Because it's there. Okay? And if you really want to show Jewish people about the suffering Messiah, what chapter would you take them to? Isaiah 53. I would say Isaiah 53. Yeah. yeah. And if you just gave Isaiah chapter 53 to any Jew and said, hey, would you read something for me? Don't tell them what it is. And he read Isaiah 53. You know what they would always tell you? Oh, that's Jesus. That's the New Testament. Right? Like a lamb led to slaughter. He was pierced through for our transgression. Right? Uh, it's not the New Testament. It's Isaiah. That's, that's what I say. Isaiah. And they go, no, that's the New <laughs> Testament. I go, yeah, go get your Bible. Mm. And they get their Bible and they open up to Isaiah 53 and they go, oh, that's in my Bible. Then they go to the rabbi. And they go, rabbi, I've never seen this before. Do you know that Jewish people don't read Isaiah 53? Anybody know why? You know why, because you study the parasha, right? What's the parasha um, when we're dealing with, uh, in August, for the most part, dealing with the seven um, um, readings of Isaiah? We stop at Isaiah 52, 12. And jump to? 54, 1. Wow. And you know how Isaiah 54, 1 starts? You know how I know that? That's my bat mitzvah portion. <laughs> it was Isaiah 54. Do you know I didn't even know it was Isaiah 54? I didn't know we skipped over Isaiah 53 because I didn't even know it was Isaiah 50. 54. I just memorized it. I found that out after I became a believer. So Jewish people don't even know Isaiah 53 exists because we skip over it. That's why chosen people um, created the website Isaiah53.com. We own it. And we give out free books. So I have an offer for everybody here today. Okay? How many people here know a Jewish person in your life? Raise your hand. Okay, about half of you. The other half don't, but here's what it, my, here's my offer. If you sign up to get my prayer letter so that you can individually pray for me, I would appreciate it. For everybody who does, you get a free copy of Isaiah chapter 53. Explain. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to know, I want you to read it first. Good book. And as you're reading it, I want you to pray. Lord, help me give this to a Jewish person. If you know somebody Jewish, please give it to them. Okay? But don't just give it to them. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to say, hey, Chuck, you know, we've been friends for a long time. Hey, a Jewish guy came to my congregation. He was, he was an incredible teacher. I'm just a joke. <laughs> And he had a book about one of your prophets. Hey, take a look at it. Tell me what you think. Because if you just give a book to somebody, you know what they can do with it? Put it on the shelf and they don't even read it. Just say, hey, take a look at it. Tell me, tell me what you think. Don't say nothing. Let the book explain itself. Then they'll figure out what it's about. And they'll come back and go, Chuck, I really, you know, I want to do that. So they'll not read it. So that they keep it. But if somebody knows that they